December 23rd, the year of our Lord, 1657. All has been quiet of late, what with the recent unpleasantness in the village, of which I have yet to make an account of. This I will do so this very evening. It seems, for the past three years, the village executioner, a man by the name of Mr. William Critchlow, has been found guilty of thievery by means of unlawfully taking possessions, monies, and other assorted valuables from those in his charge who have been sentenced to death. Upon carrying out his most grisly of deeds, he would retire with the bodies to his private residence, at which point the bodies of the recently departed would be stripped of all material worth before he would see their way to Messrs. George and Whitlow, the town grave diggers, for their internment into the lesser tended area of the graveyard. His terrible crimes were only unearthed, if you will pardon use of the expression, when he was found to be stumbling through the streets, his left arm cleaved partially through just below the shoulder. It seems in his diligence of keeping the tools of his trade ready, an accident had occurred with his grinding wheel. In his confused and adult state, he spun a fanciful tale, one that told of the spirits of the dead exacting their revenge upon him. It was only when the local watchman visited his place of work that they found evidence of his gruesome crimes. His arm could not be saved by the town doctor and had to be removed due to infection in the wound, although many of us already suspected an infection of the mind that could cause a man to do such things. Despite many attempts by the local magistrates and other officials to convince him to return the items he stole, he refused ever to tell of what he had done with his takings. He was executed two nights past this eve. His final words to the crowd to be written here now. That which I have taken will remain mine, and any who try to take it from me will bring my vengeance upon themselves, as those I have taken from try to do so to me. It was a bleak December evening that of two days before Christmas, when I found myself stepping off the train in a small town at half the hour past five. Small white flakes fluttered from the sky, and my footfalls were softened by the crunch as I began to trudge through the snow towards the local inn, not more than half a mile from the station. By the time I had arrived, I was thoroughly chilled through. All was quiet in the night except the odd person coming and going from the glowing door of the inn. The light from the door cast the many footprints into sharp relief, some taken in large strides as if to get home quickly, others, too, side by side, a couple perhaps, all huddled in as if to turn against this fearful cold. One set appeared to pass by the inn altogether, a single deep track by the side of the footprints, clearly someone wheeling their bike home, a sensible move, I should have thought. With this snow falling on already trodden snow, there would no doubt be sheet ice underneath if one were to clear away the top layers. Once in from the cold, I was greeted by the friendly visage of my old friend, Professor Richard Summers, an acquaintance of whom I had not seen in nearly four years, but had kept in touch with by means of regular exchange correspondences. He had lost his wife some months previous from a fever, and, left with no children in an empty house, had decided to take an extended convalescence. I, being a bachelor myself, had no other plans, so it was over the course of months that we planned this small reunion at Christmas time. Whilst he was here on personal business, the nature of which he would disclose to me when we met. After a warm welcome and a delicious meal, during which time we had the course to catch up and inquire after each other's recent events, we retired to the chairs by the fire, a welcome comfort in this cold season. As I sat by the fire, my companion returned to the bar to buy us two double brandies. As I sat, I overheard a curious conversation between two local gentlemen as they entered. Oi, escaped two nights ago last week, they said. How we got out, they don't rightly know. Is he dangerous? Oh, ay, I should say so. They say he was caught axe in hand, and all covered in blood he was. It was that young maid at the old Royston place. Terrible it were by all accounts. Well, I don't fancy his chances out there tonight. Mora can be a wild place during the day, let alone at night. I must admit, even in this peaceful and most comfortable setting, their words did chill my very bones, and when Summers returned, 
I found myself taking a large gulp of brandy to steady my nerves. He asked if I was quite well, and pushing the conversation to the back of my mind, I told him to pay it no attention, and to finally tell me the reason for his coming to this small town. The story of which he told me, unfortunately, did no good to putting the local's conversation to the back of my mind. Yet, I found his story most intriguing. It seems that at one time, a past relative of his had lived in this town, at which time it was no more than a mere village. During the lifetime of this relative, it seems an incident occurred whereby the local village executioner, one Mr. Critchlow, was found guilty of stealing from those he had executed, and in turn been executed himself. The relative had written in his diaries that whilst Critchlow had never revealed the location of his spoils, of his crimes, he claimed to have, through careful research and quiet correspondence with unmentioned people, have discovered the location of the stolen items. As a young boy, Somers had heard this story many a time, but only upon taking residence of his former relative's property did he discover, among many papers, one such diary that did indeed give confirmation of the truth to these stories. With much excitement, he showed me the diary entry, and it did all seem to indicate one location as to where the loot, as sometimes Somers referred to it, was hidden. We agreed to meet here, downstairs, at first light, and set out to see what we could find. The rest of the evening passed somewhat quietly. Eventually, when the locals began to wend their way homewards, we were joined by the inn's proprietor, who, being glad at this unusually quiet time to have people staying in his rooms, treated us to another two double brandies and took one for himself. He told us the history of the inn, the town, and the prison on the moors. This last one again reminded me of the conversation between the locals, as, out of the corner of my eye, I had seen them talking to the innkeeper earlier that eve. I inquired as to their story. Much to my unease, the proprietor confirmed their story to be true, as whilst I had been otherwise occupied in conversation with Summers, a warden from the prison had come in to warn him of the escapee. Obviously seeing the look of intense worry on my face, he reassured me that all the doors and the windows shutters were securely locked and bolted from the inside, and nothing short of a cannon would penetrate them. I sensed a slight exaggeration in this, but nonetheless it was enough to keep me at ease, as retiring some hours later I found myself at peace in the arms of sleep. Although, one time I awoke to the sound of movement in the hall outside my door. The sound of footfalls, light but slow, and even more curious, the sound of something heavy being dragged along the floor. However, when I craned my head to listen closely, the sound seemed to have stopped. I dismissed it most likely as another visitor tending to the nightly call, scraping probably nothing more than tree at the window outside. I was up before the dawn broke, ready for the morning's adventure. It would be a wonderful Christmas, even if we were to find what we set out to seek. The proprietor was up early as well, opening the windows, letting in the beautiful morning light that bathed the interior of the inn as it rose like a golden tide stretching out over the distant hills. Whilst waiting for Summers, and remembering the events of the night, I inquired as to others staying at the inn. He told me that there were none, and that we were the only occupants of his rooms. Perhaps then he had been the one moving around that night. No, he had slept straight through from the previous night, and gotten up this morning ready to start the new day. Must have been Summers then, I surmised, although the nature as the scratching sound, of which I was not entirely convinced was a true branch of the window, I was still unsure. Glancing at my watch, I noticed that Summers had still not yet risen. So, taking the stairs nearest the door, I climbed to his room. Finding myself at the opposite end of the outside hallway of our rooms, the staircase by the fire where he had been the night previous rising from the other end, I made my way along to Summers' door. It was only as I walked that I noticed dark footprints on the floor, as if someone had trodden snow in from the outside, which had now melted. Had Summers been out in the night? Curious, still, was the faint but unmistakable trace of a deep score mark on the wooden flooring, as if something had been dragged alongside whomever had been walking there previous. The events of the night before refreshed in my mind, and I made my way to Summer's door and knocked, but to no reply. I knocked again and called, but 
Still, he did not answer. At this point, I tried the handle, but it appeared the door was locked. Not only this, but I noticed that the footprints not only stopped outside Summer's door, but the score mark in the floor turned from the corridor and appeared to disappear under the door into the room. Knocking slightly more urgently, I called again, but to no avail. Panic beginning to take a grip on me now, I darted back down the stairs and informed the innkeeper I could not rouse Summers, and that his door was locked. After he found a spare key for Summers' door, we made an attempt to make entrance to Summers' room, but the lock would not take the key. It seemed to be locked from within. Fearing that my friend may be in dire need of help, the proprietor agreed that in the circumstances we should force the door open. Using a nearby table to break the lock, we entered and found a horrific scene that would never likely leave my mind. Summers lay on the bed, the white sheets now stained a vivid red. His clothes were tattered, through which could be seen the flaps of skin on his chest splayed open to reveal deep splits out of which protruded various bits of flesh and bone. His face was looking straight ahead, but a large gash extending from his forehead to the bridge of what remained of his nose left the right side of his face tilted to one side, his eye dangling loosely from its socket. The local constabulary were called in, as was the town doctor, although short of being administered the last rites, nothing could be done for poor Summers. Whilst no evidence of a breaking could be found, the police highly suspected the escaped prisoner. It would seem that prior to my arrival, the day after the escape, another murder had been committed at a local farm. It seems the farmer disturbed the prisoner in his barn, and when he discovered he, the prisoner, had taken up a nearby hatchet and brutally murdered the old man. I will not hide the fact that the story of Critchlow and his last words did but play on my mind during these events. Before the police arrived, I must admit, I had retold these to the innkeeper, whom, in the course of telling us of the town's history, had also made mention of the event. And whilst both of us fervently denied to the other any belief in such tales, I am sure neither of us felt truly at ease. Being a suspect, I was not allowed to leave the inn immediately, but once the investigation had been conducted, and for my part being cleared of any involvement, I was free to leave. However, I stayed for another week, as Summers had no family, I felt duty-bound to see that his affairs were in order, and in staying, I ensured that he was interned at the local graveyard, among his distant relatives who had lived there so many years previous. It was on my last day before I was due to leave for the station that I once again found myself by the fire, only this time with the proprietor, drinking a toast to Summer's memory. The inn was quiet, and we were the only two persons taking shelter from the cold, until the door opened, and once again in came the warden. Having missed him the first time, I did not recognise him until the innkeeper introduced him. He greeted me warmly, and spoke kind words in respect of my recent loss. I thanked him, and we all sat down by the fire again. As we talked, I noticed the warden shifting slightly uncomfortably. The innkeeper must have noticed this too, as he made inquiry as if all was well. The warden did not speak at first, but then said to me, as much as the innkeeper, the news of Summer's murder, that it was not entirely good news, and that perhaps I would be better off not hearing it. I begged his pardon and told him that anything he had to say regarding my friend, good or not, would be greatly received by me. Although now I know what he had to say, I wish I hadn't asked. It seems that the body of the prisoner was found on the moors. The hatchet from the farm stood in his possession, but his neck was broken. It seems in the darkness of the moors he had wandered over the edge of the cliff and fell to his death. For a moment I felt a sense of relief almost what one might call justice, for the man who had killed my friend had now paid for his crimes with his own life. However, the warden proceeded to tell us that it would seem he had been dead for nearly a week, as by the doctor's account from whom he had just come from, he would have died on the night of the first murder, the farm being less from a mile from where he was found. It seems the identity of those responsible for Summer's murders would likely never be known. I will say, in closing, that this revelation haunted my mind 
all the way down to the station. Perhaps there was some truth in Critchlow's words, that he would always protect what was his. Because as I walked down towards the station, with my head bowed against this howling winter, I was sure that behind me I could hear footsteps and another sound of something heavy being dragged, scraping 